<laughs> Back with the author of Prequel, An American Fight Against Fascism, Rachel Maddow. At the, in the January 6th uh, case, which will be in Washington, D.C., the uh, Trump team is lobbying for there to be cameras allowed in the courtroom. Why do you think that would be beneficial? Or why do you think that they think that would be a benefit to him? I think he likes being on TV. And so, I mean, you see that, like, the, sure. c- the civil trial, he d- the, the one where Don Jr. just testified, yeah. he doesn't have to be there for that trial. It's a civil trial. There's no criminal charges. You don't have to be in the courtroom. But he's been there every day, and every time he, every time there's a break, he walks out of the courtroom and looks for a camera. Right. It's like Because, the like, way even his rallies aren't getting the kind of coverage they used to get, but everyone's going to cover him in court. Because it seems like a dramatic confrontation and right. a moment of accountability for him. And so I think that's probably just it. Listen, I think there's a public interest in having cameras in the courtroom. And, um, what, NBC... what, is the, what is that public interest? Because I know that NBC is lobbying for that to happen. Yeah, NBC is one of the entities that's asking the court to do it. And the prosecutors are saying, no, they don't want it. And Trump is saying, yes, he does. So it's interesting in terms of how the court is going to decide. And it'll be the judge. Do you often decision. agree with Donald Trump on legal matters? <laughs> This is, a, this, is a rare, this is a feeling. This is a rare feeling? one. Okay. Yeah, this makes me. Just... I would love it because I have footage yeah. to run to make fun of him. <laughs> but that, but that is a selfish endeavor on my behalf. I don't think it would be better for the republic necessary. But uh, but I I think the other thing you'd have is the the footage showing due process, mm-hmm. showing about how the showing how the legal process works. So even in the cases that he's involved in now, like the civil case, he's saying, oh, the judge is a monster and the judge's clerk is terrible and it's all so unfair and it's all just well if we could see what was going on with the camera while it was happening we would know whether or not that was bs or whether or not he was actually being treated by the legal treated fairly by the legal system and so transparency for court cases as serious and important as this i think there's a there's a good case for it even if he does want it (laughs) now the um It, in, in the book here, uh, prequel, uh, an American fight against fascism, uh, as you said, as you intimated before, is that we've been through this before yeah. and possibly worse. What was America's flirtation with fascism before this? When have we sort of dodged this bullet? The one that I write about in the book is just in the lead up to World War II. So by 1940, like 83% of the public didn't want us to join World War II. And for most people, that was just, you know, we just had World War I. We don't want to get involved in another war in Europe. But for some significant portion of Americans, they thought, well, if we are going to get involved in World War II, let's fight on the German side. Um, there was because... A, because Hitler has the right idea and fascism is the wave of the future. 1941, the best-selling book in America was written by Charles Lindbergh's wife. And it was a book about the beauty and promise of fascism. The good news there is that by 1943, two years later, the best-selling book in the country was written by a guy who infiltrated all the pro-Nazi groups in America and spilled all the tea on all of them (laughs) um, and exposed them all and showed how terrible they were and that they were all getting Nazi support. So, I mean, the country really went through it. It was a huge a huge part of the news about what was going on in our country in the lead up to World War II. And we've forgotten it because then we fought World War II and that's that's a more comfortable story to tell. But there were a lot of Americans here, some who were working for the Nazis, but a lot of whom wanted fascism on our side. Um, You you ran MSNBC's coverage of the last Republican debate. And I'm so sorry. (laughs) Because (laughs) it's, it's a tough gig because you're talking to people who are supposedly competing to be the nominee for the Republican Party to be the next president of the United States, and yet the person who's actually beating them by 30, 40, 50, depending on the state, points, is not there. Yeah. And who, other than Chris Christie, though not as much as you would expect, are not throwing any punches at the guy. As if they have all these 91 knives at their disposal there from his, you know, his indictments. Yeah. And they don't use them. What do you think is happening with those folks? Those folks, I think, all know that what they are competing for is the silver medal, that they're really, they're fighting each other to come in second in the Republican presidential primary. There is no second prize. You don't get anything with the silver medal. Unless he goes to jail? And then maybe maybe they're the last man standing? And so maybe you want to end up not totally antagonizing the people in the Republican Party who like Donald Trump so you can absorb his votes when something when he gets struck by lightning. I don't know. But it's it is sad to see them not trying to win. 
not trying to knock Trump out other than Chris Christie, um, really just trying to draft in his wake. That's why those, that's, that's why covering those debates feels like a wake. Right, yeah. and you're talking to eight dead people on stage. <laughs> it's not, it's not, it's not nice. It's not a, it's not a nice That's the only reason I don't do it. <laughs> they keep asking. We have to take a little break, but when we come back, more Rachel, everybody. Don't go nowhere. <laughs> 